Right, good, every, uh, good, everyone. good morning, everyone. Good day to you all. Please feel free to take your seats. Uh, it is so good to be here with you this morning, and I'm really grateful that we are all here in this time that we get to share together. And I would like to start just with a little walk down memory lane. Back in 2016, the world-renowned tech company Apple, they released their newly updated MacBook Pro. And over many years of innovation and branding, Apple had built a legion of fans that celebrated every release of a new or updated product. But in October of that year, when the keynote address was given by the CEO of Apple, the product that they released was met with controversy and divided opinion. You see, the new MacBook Pro had undergone a complete kind of design overhaul, and one of the changes uh, that they'd made was that they had removed a whole bunch of ports which were used to connect HDMI cables and or insert standard USB sticks or SD cards, and they'd replaced them with four Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports, which at the time was a brand new technology of the future. Now, if you don't understand or are a bit confused by the terminology that I just used, don't feel bad. I spent 30 minutes on Google writing and researching those last 50 words. But in an instant, with this introduction of this new technology, this new product, a compatibility issue suddenly became apparent. Because how were people supposed to use their existing kind of computer-related uh, things with this brand new technology. And as this compatibility issue kind of emerged and people became more and more aware of it, people responded in a whole number of different ways. Some just completely dismissed the uh, suddenly outdated old technology and fully embraced the new. Uh, others avoided the new and opted to keep using something that was just a little bit more familiar to them. And others sought ways to connect the old technology with the new. Compatibility issues, they're a common occurrence and a challenge when it comes to technology and how rapidly it continues to, to develop. But if we think about it, they also consistently arise in other areas of our lives. Sometimes the compatibility issue, it emerges within the arena of our school, maybe university, our workplace or vacation or within our families. In an instant or over time, it becomes clear that the culture or the values or the direction of that environment doesn't align with us or we with it. Sometimes an issue of compatibility becomes apparent as we age, as we transition into a new stage of life or experience a sudden change in circumstances. So I've learned that not getting eight hours of sleep at night is no longer compatible with functioning throughout the day with the focus and the optimal energy that I want. But I've also realized that having two young children under the age of three is no longer compatible with having eight hours of sleep. Do you see the dilemma that I have? But in all seriousness, I think one of the main areas of our lives in which we experience compatibility issues is with people, in our relationships with family, with friends, colleagues, neighbours and others. And that's not even mentioning romantic relationships. Compatibility issues, they seemingly arise between people on almost everything and anything, whether it's appearances, personality, behavior, values, beliefs, cultures, political ideologies, TV show or movie preferences, music taste, or your taste in food. The list is endless, isn't it? And if we think a little bit deeper about it, compatibility issues almost always seem to arise because of a difference, a difference in opinion, perspective, a difference in culture or background, or a difference in expectation or preference. And when compatibility issues are caused by difference become increasingly apparent, I think one of the instinctive reactions we have is to divide and distance ourselves. When there's a difference between ourselves and others and then it causes a compatibility issue, it seems that division is easier than remaining connected in respectful relationship and dialogue. You just need to look at how the general tone and language uh, is, that's used when anything controversial is discussed in the public space. 
and especially online, to see how different views rarely unite, they rather divide. It's us versus them, me versus you. And it shouldn't surprise any of us then that compatibility issues so frequently exist within the church as well. Because a lot of differences exist amongst Christians as well. It might relate to a theological position, a a way that uh, different people interpret or understand the Bible or aspects of the Bible, or even just the way that people express their faith in God. And that's not even mentioning the compatibility issues that can arise from difference in personalities between generations or varying stages of life within the church, as well as the different cultural uh, and religious backgrounds that are reflected amongst different people here. Now, to be clear, differences aren't inherently a bad thing. They should really be celebrated. But you and I know the obvious and the subtle ways that differences so easily divide. Whether it's the people that we purposefully avoid in the lobby before or after a service, the people that you hope won't sit next to you on a Sunday morning, or maybe there's an age or a gender or cultural demographic where the differences leave us feeling awkward or uncertain or threatened so we remain at a comfortable distance. Or perhaps it's certain questions that we avoid asking or conversations that we avoid having because we know that they'll likely lead to tension and maybe even conflict and so our connections and our conversations just simply remain at a surface level the question then is whether there's a better way to relate to each other for the people of god is there a better way to navigate the compatibility issues that we might assume or encounter in the church Well, as we close out our troubleshooting series in 1 Timothy today, we're going to see some of the wisdom that was given to a young man who was faced with this very same question. But before we do, I would like to pray and ask God to help us, not just to learn something new, but to be inspired about what we can do within our relationships with others where issues of compatibility exist. Let's pray together. Our God, as we approach this topic around our relationships towards others within the church, I recognize the many and different experiences that we each have with varied good, challenging, and painful memories. And so I'm asking that you might give us an ability to grow in wisdom and sense your personal invitation on how we might each respond to the differences or divisions causing issues amongst us. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Well, as we've been reminded throughout this series, the letter of 1 Timothy was written by the renowned church planter Paul to his young protege, Timothy. And Paul had sent Timothy to an incredibly diverse church community that was crumbling with division and tension that had emerged through the influence of some people in their midst. And as Chris mentioned in the first week of this series, Paul frames some of the issues and his reasons for sending Timothy with these words. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. And so as a result of the controversies that these false teachers were fabricating, one of Paul's main concerns was how this was causing division within the church and taking attention away from the most important purpose for those in the church, advancing the work of God in their life and in their church and in their world. Two Bible commentators, they described the problem like this, the church had become increasingly misshapen. It was losing its center. The main things, gospel and mission, were becoming increasingly marginalized. See, division can have such a detrimental effect. And for the Ephesian church, divisions were ultimately distracting them from the things that mattered the most. And so alongside giving Timothy instructions on how to address the theological and cultural issues that were causing these divisions, Paul also gave some relational guidelines to help frame a better way to navigate the compatibility issues that existed in this church. 
And it was all with the intended hope that by doing so, this church would rediscover its purpose and begin pursuing it together. So we're going to look at just three of these relational guidelines today, which frame a perspective to take, an example to set, and a posture to adopt when it comes to the way that people relate to each other within the church. And the first guideline is all about perspective, specifically viewing the church as a family. You see, Paul was a big proponent of using the image of family to describe the church community. It's a strong metaphor that's used right throughout the entire Bible, particularly in the New Testament, to describe followers of Jesus. And a little over halfway through this letter, Paul says these words to Timothy. I'm writing to you with these instructions, so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Do you see the family language? As Christians, we're to view ourselves as being part of God's household, the family of God. And it's one of the incredible realities of the gospel that we've just sung about. Because regardless of who you are, where you've come from, what you've done, or the status in life that you currently have, anyone can respond to the gospel and anyone can be welcomed into the family of God. And it's a pretty unique looking family because everyone, uh, not everyone looks like each other. Not everyone thinks like each other. There's a whole number of different personalities and cultural and theological values, ages and stages of life. And yet, all followers of Jesus are part of the same family of God. So one of the implications of being family is that it establishes and affects the way that we relate to each other. Now, I recognize that we all have varying experiences, good and bad, of family relationships in our own lives. But I think that most, if not all of us, can get a sense of the ideal vision we desire and aspire to ourselves when it comes to the depth of connection and commitment within family. So even when there is strong disagreement, when tensions are running high or because of a variety of different reasons, there might be a difference in perspective or preference. Being part of the family of God establishes a connection and commitment to each other that should not be easily broken. When divisions, tensions, or questions of compatibility arise within the church community, the depth of connection and commitment is family should influence the way that we think, speak, and act in response. That's the first guideline. And the second speaks to the influence that just one person can have within the family of God simply by setting a better example. Here's what Paul writes to Timothy. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. For Timothy, these words, they give a framework for what his life should look like and the influence that he can have on others, regardless of his age and the challenges that that may have provided. And what's interesting is that when Paul calls Timothy to set an example for others, he's, he's using a word picture that means more than just demonstrating the correct way of doing things. One commentator explains it like this, the word picture that it paints is not so much that Timothy is an example that others can emulate, but that he is a mold that should be pressed into the lives of others so that they attain the same shape. So as Timothy's life is shaped by the gospel, the way his faith is outwardly expressed should so influence others that their lives begin to be shaped and look like his. It's a prime example of the influence that people can have on each other. And we see examples of this in profound and not so profound ways all the time. Here's one example. 
If you happen to be passing by a footy oval on a Saturday, or perhaps see a large group of adolescents or young adult guys at the shopping centre and elsewhere in public, the chances are that over the last 12 to 18 months that you'll see many of them rocking this hairstyle. Now, mullets were popular back in the, in the 80s, and then they became a source of deep shame and regret for many who have photos of themselves that are kept hidden away from the public eye. But for some reason, they've seen a resurgence in popularity of late. Maybe it's because young boys and men have a tendency to make decisions that they will regret later on in life. <laughs> it could be that over the last couple of years, many have just simply started cutting their hair at home, and this one's quick and easy, and you don't have to have the flexibility to be able to reach the whole way behind. Or it could be because just some professional sportsmen now rock this style and all it takes is a few early adopters to make something cool again. But when a couple of boys or young men adopt this hairstyle, it has an influence and becomes an example for others to do the same. That's an albeit trivial example of the influence that people can have in shaping the lives of others. And the call of Paul to Timothy, though, is to set an example in a much more profound way. It has to do with the shape and influence of his speech, his conduct, his love, faith, and purity. Five specific areas which also appear to have been most impacted through the issues within the Ephesian church. And so the shape of Timothy's speech and conduct is meant to provide a Jesus-focused alternative to the false teachings and love of money that had caused all kinds of tensions and controversies. His love and faith is meant to model and shape how this community, full of divisions and differences, can best remain committed and connected as part of the family of God. And his purity, which most scholars tend to agree relates specifically to the arena of sexual purity, is meant to provide a countercultural example of how to best live a life above reproach, where his motives and his conduct can stand up to scrutiny. As Timothy sets a better example in all of these things in his life, the potential for things to change within the church increases as other people's lives are shaped by his one person at a time. And that's just the influence that Timothy can have within this church family. But this isn't just a unique responsibility or opportunity for him. It's also true for us. Because all of us have influence on others. For better or for worse, it's a fundamental force in every single relationship. Which means that every single one of us has the opportunity and responsibility to set a better example, to set a better example as followers of Jesus. The question then is, what kind of example is our life setting? And if our lives are, are mold, if our lives are pressing in and shaping the lives of others, is that a good thing? Well, after framing earlier the church as a family, and immediately following on from describing the influence that we can have through the example that we set, Paul gives a third relational guideline. And it describes a posture that practically guides the way that we relate to each other. We're just going to look at, th at the first three verses of 1 Timothy 5, where Paul guides Timothy with these words. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. Now, these first three verses actually give a really good snapshot of the theme of this entire section, which sort of flows the whole way through into chapter 6. And we just don't have the time to cover it in the detail that it requires. But these first three verses speak to all kind of the different spheres of relationship that Timothy as a young man has within the church family at Ephesus. With older men and younger men, 
older women and younger women. All realms of relationship with people are covered here. And it's almost like a case study which practically d- demonstrates how Timothy is meant to relate to others. And these practical examples, they all stem from having a particular posture, a posture of honour and respect. So when it comes to the older men, even if they're in the wrong and they need to be told about it, Timothy is not to strike out at them with a verbal lashing, even if he's in the right. Instead, with respect and honour, viewing them as a father, he should urge and encourage them. When it comes to older women, the same respect and honour is expected to be displayed by viewing them as a mother. And in relation to younger men and women, Timothy is to have an attitude of mutual respect. And so even though he's a leader in this community, he should view the women and the men his age and younger as sisters and brothers. And then there's this reference to widows. You see, the church from the beginning had a responsibility of caring for those who had nobody to look after them and no means to support themselves. But when Timothy is told to give the proper recognition to those who are widows, the meaning behind that term relates to more than just meeting a need. Giving proper proper recognition to widows meant honouring them as part of the church family. It was an incredibly countercultural change in perspective because it elevated and emphasized their value and dignity as humans instead of just being people in need. And so when we look at what is meant to guide Timothy in all of these different spheres of relationship within the church family, for old and young, women and men, those in need and those who can meet a need, there's this recurring posture that guides how to relate to all people, a posture of honor and respect and it has the potential to have a significant effect for a church that was facing issues causing uh, facing issues causing division a little respect and honor goes a long way and it could completely revolutionize the relational dynamics between people in this community a posture of honor and respect it changes the way that issues are addressed because the conversation is approached with a desire to win the person, not just to simply win the argument and be right. It creates an environment that cultivates right relationships with others as equals, regardless of the power dynamics that might be related to gender or age or social status as they exist. And it leads to recognizing the value and the dignity that all people have, regardless of what they might need or the challenges that they may have in life. That's the effect that a posture of honor and respect can have. It's a relational guideline which, like the others, has such a potent power because it opens up so many possibilities to establish or strengthen or heal relationships with so many people. And it's why I think Paul gives them in the first place. Because when, division, when differences and divisions emerge between people, these guidelines help us take a perspective, set an example, and adopt a posture that enables us to navigate compatibility issues within the church. And let's not forget the point of it all. That in so doing these things, we might remain or return to the center of what the church should be all about gospel and mission, that God's work in us, in our church, and in our world by faith might be advanced and not diminished. And so when issues of difference or division arise in our relationships, in this church community, here at Single Baptist, what might a practical step actually look like to apply one or more of these relational guidelines into practice in our lives. With the compatibility issues that we might currently be assuming or experiencing in relation to others, what might a perspective on this church's family, a recognition of the influence we have through the example that we set, and a posture of honour and respect lead us to do next? There's an almost endless list of what a practical step could look like. You might even know exactly what you need to do right now. 
But if you want a starting point, then I'd like to suggest a practice that I first heard from a guy called Rob Coyle while I was interning at the Christian organization Youth Dimension. You see, whenever differences or divisions or conflict arose between people there, and when these things began to have a detrimental effect on the relationship in the broader community, one of the first practical steps that he would encourage those involved to take was this, increase proximity. It means to intentionally move towards the persons, the personal people with whom differences, division or conflict exist between us and them. Instead of withdrawing or keeping our distance from them, we move towards them. Increase proximity. It involves making a decision to intentionally spend more time with, to get to know better or to increase opportunities to connect with those we might have an issue of difference or division increase proximity now it's important to note that when there are issues of abuse in any of its forms increasing proximity with a perpetrator that is not the message that i want you to hear in those instances it's better to increase proximity with safe people who can advocate for and walk the road with you in the process of seeking justice But when issues of difference or division arise because of an opinion or a perspective that someone might hold, or their culture and background might be different to yours, or their expectations or preferences don't appear to be compatible with you, when when these issues of difference and division arise within the church, and they do, increasing proximity is a great starting point that follows all three of the relational guidelines that we've looked at today. It's a movement that demonstrates the reality of church as family. And so the depth of connection and commitment with each other is something that is not easily broken. It leverages and amplifies the influence that we have with others as we set a better example simply because we increase proximity with them. And it requires a posture of honour and respect to actually make the first move. When we intentionally increase proximity with others, one of the surprising things that we just might discover is that the issues that we assume or experience might not be as divisive as we initially believed them to be. Or it might provide a platform on which we can work out our differences or issues with each other. And so there's only one last question to ask, and it comes in two parts. Who do you need to increase proximity with? And what might that involve you doing? Who do you need to increase proximity with in this church? Is it someone in this congregation? Is it someone in a life group or a ministry that you're involved in? Is it someone from a different culture or someone from a different congregation? Someone that you've known for a long time or someone that you've avoided connecting with at anything deeper than just a surface level? Who might you need to increase proximity with? And what, that, what might that involve you doing? Might it involve reaching out Forgiving first, learning more about them, or spending more intentional time with them. Who do you need to increase proximity with in this church community? And what might that involve you doing? Well, as you consider your response, let's invite God into the decision-making process as we decide what we're going to do. Let's do that right now as I finish and we pray. God, I thank you for giving all people the invitation to become part of your family. And I thank you for the opportunity that we have in this church community at Sindel to experience a glimpse of how diverse and all-encompassing your family is. But God, we recognize that because of this, there are so many differences that can lead to division amongst us. God, would you bring us an awareness of these differences and divisions? Would you help us navigate them in a way that brings us closer together instead of driving us apart? 
God, would you speak to us individually and as a community, revealing what we can do in order to keep the things that matter most front and centre in our lives and in this church. And God, in this moment of silence, would you show us a particular person or bring to mind a specific relationship that you're inviting us to intentionally increase proximity in? For the people who have come to mind, God, would you give us the opportunity, the conviction and the courage to intentionally increase proximity with them today, this week, and in the weeks to come. And as we do, would you surprise us with what might happen as a result? And so it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.